Once I get clients to lose their visceral fat, they so they move ahead so much more quicker in life. Their quality of living is better. They look better. They perform better. So no testosterone, no hormones. I've never taken any of that. No gear at all. All natural. So what is the number one reason that people can't lose the visceral fat that nobody is talking about? How can people actually go about losing visceral fat, belly fat? Yeah, so a big problem with losing is there isn't a lot of good information out there through resources that people are tapping into to eliminate visceral fat. So if you jump on the internet, there's kind of uh, urban legend kind of stuff out there like eat lots of servings of grains and, and uh, cereals a day, and that actually will increase your visceral fat. So this gets kind of persistent, passed around. And so the best way to visceral fat, uh, lose visceral fat is uh, actually – my content I put on Instagram is from our experience studying 6,000 people losing visceral fat and testing, you know, through uh, repetitive serial MRIs, what impacts uh, visceral fat, either increasing it and diminishing it. So the first thing uh, really to eliminate visceral fat is cutting out processed foods. So uh, in this image here, I'll just show you uh, the significant amount of visceral fat that's reduced in this guy who just cut out processed foods, especially processed carbs, and all he did was eat clean. So he ate meat and vegetables. This is about eight years ago for study for the National Science Foundation. And these are a series of M MRI scans through uh, the abdomen of this 68-year-old guy. So visceral fat in this image is all red. And then two weeks, you can see the significant reduction this guy had in just two weeks, Max, cutting out those processed carbs, processed foods. And then over a period of time of 35 weeks, you see a dramatic reduction in his visceral fat. But also, if you have a discerning eye, you can see uh, in an MRI this red streak and this dark structure, which is the oblique muscles. The muscles show up as dark on an MRI. Uh, there's fat being deposited in this muscle. Now, you don't want to have fat deposited in your muscle. Hmm. You, you want fat around your muscle, but not in your muscle. In this case, it's in his muscle. And you can see uh, that over 35 weeks, this guy completely loses his fat in his muscle, which is a good thing. So there are many people listening, many of your followers, and people who will ultimately see this podcast that have fat in their muscles and they're not aware of. So right away, the first thing I would tell people who are tuning into this show and have the benefit of learning about visceral fat that we're going to be talking about is you want to cut out processed foods and you want to eat clean mm. and then the power of an MRI to track that so that you can see if you're going to start eating clean and many people can do this easily. Some people need encouragement, need that feedback then the MRI will allow you to do that. So I'm very excited that visceral fat appears to be taking off uh, through social media and uh, the internet, especially social media, and through influencers like you that are catching it and seeing that this is really an important metric, a biomarker that we should be paying attention to in the health space because conventional health is not promoting it. It's not taught in medical school. It's not something that nurses learn about. PAs, uh, nurse practitioners, or physicians. It's really uh, not part of curriculum of any medical school, and that's very unfortunate. Hmm. So what is taught is are things like uh, lipids and cholesterol because you can make a lot of money. And the big answer to visceral fat um, is there's no CPT code. So there's no revenue attached to making a diagnosis, much less treating it. And so it's not part of our training as a physician. I'm an MD. Uh, we're not instructed on it because there's no revenue through the system. So mm. uh, if you're listening today and you want to get rid of your visceral fat, you're going to have to pay out of pocket because the system will not pay for you to lose this in, in the form of conventional treatment. So it's really influencers like you that are raising this as an issue and a point in discussion that uh, really are going to help change people's lives really save lives. Hmm. But is, is waist size not part of the constellation of features that characterize metabolic syndrome? No, that's a really good point. Really, really good point. So you can see in this image, and I forgot to make that point, 
Waist size is revealed in what's, what is a metric in this image called sagittal abdominal diameter. So if you draw a line from the top, the anterior aspect of that yellow, which is visceral, I'm sorry, subcutaneous fat, to the posterior aspect of this guy in his back. And by the way, these are the back muscles. And this guy is are laying. Are these like the love handles right there? Yeah, these are love handles. So <laughs> he's laying on his back. His love handles are down. And his belly is staring up at the ceiling. He's, he's going through this MRI scanner. So the sagittal waist diameter, um, size of the waist, is revealed in that line. Sagittal abdominal, abdominal diameter or the abdominal circumference. But look how that changed over the course of 35 weeks. So this guy goes from having a dad bod to now having an oval-shaped abdomen. And the, the answer is, mathematically, is the abdominal diameter in the sagittal plane right here has been reduced significantly. Hmm. And he has this oval shape. So now he's got a shape like a 20-year-old collegiate swimmer. And what's interesting, Max, is all he did was cut out processed carbs, processed foods. He did not exercise one minute. So if you think that you're going to exercise yourself out of visceral fat, you would be mistaken about that. You've got to get control of what's going into your body. Mm. You've got to respect your body and not allow dietary contributions to visceral fat to remain. And there are, there are many things that contribute to visceral fat that we figured out for the National Science Foundation. But you're, you're right. I think in the future, we'll be able to do these measurements, sagittal abdominal diameter, and pretty reliably infer the amount of visceral fat that people have by simply that metric. However, what really is helpful is showing people visibly so that they can actually see this disease process. And you really should be thinking of visceral fat as disease. This disease that's present inside of you, in most cases, nobody has awareness about. It's invisible. So it's this like parasitic uh, alien, this disease. And it was the first uh, expression of disease that we saw in human beings uh, in children. So, you know, it's always interesting to me to contemplate that, you know, we never talked about in medical school, what is the first disease process that shows up in children? And from my experience now working uh, as specializing as a health and performance optimizing physician, the very first expression of disease that are, that is present in humans is visceral fat. And we saw this in four-year-olds. And uh, it really was pretty much like it is in 40-year-olds. How many waffles do they eat? How many pancakes do they eat? How many bowls of sugary cereals versus how many meals of maybe steak and, and uh, omelets and uh, uh, wholesome clean foods without these uh, processed foods coming, especially carbohydrates, uh, causing this contribution of visceral fat. So even in kids early on, we see the significance of diet and, and, uh, and then it just is accumulates over a period of time. So that by the time that four-year-old hits 40, if he or she has continued to eat in, in that particular manner, they will have accumulated a huge amount of visceral fat. Now, wow. in a four-year-old, uh, there's not, not as much visceral fat, but the, it's the accumulation of visceral fat and not its presence that causes, a, causes the problem. So when it accumulates... The way visceral fat works is it releases inflammatory molecules, hmm. and that is what causes the problem. It's not so much the presence of the visceral fat, but it's secretory. So it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, secreting these inflammatory molecules that end up causing harm. So what that means is if you take somebody and you eliminate their visceral fat, you're not going to see much benefit immediately because the harm was caused by the years and in many cases decades of an inflammatory secretory molecules causing that damage. And the opposite can also be the case where you take a lean person like yourself and I open, open your abdomen up and I deposit in 10 pounds of this visceral fat, you're going to go on pretty much for the next six months and not have much effect at all. But 10 pounds of this visceral fat inside of you will be slowly causing inflammation and destruction. And unless you do something about it, like get rid of it through what I would advocate is lifestyle, nobody's going to do what we call surgical laparotomy, open up your abdomen and remove that visceral fat. It's so entangled in there that it's just not surgically 
uh, an option for to, to, to surgically remove it. The best way to remove it is through lifestyle, starting with uh, processed food. So um, it's really helpful for people to be aware of visceral fats, uh, nature and characteristic being secretory and causing this inflammation, and then understanding that uh, even once you remove it, you, you've got to recover the damage that mm. happens. So a lot of my clients, um, and maybe this would be a good time to show this picture, a lot of my clients lose a lot of visceral fat, and then um, they they think that immediately they're going to be different, you know, from as a result of doing it. So here's an image of me with no visceral fat. But look how uh, unhealthy I look. Mm. I, actually, another way to look at this is unattractive. <laughs> um, my belly is sticking out. I have uh, soft lunch lady arms. <laughs> I've got a, a crooked, let um, me just show my head. I have a crooked um, posture to my body. Still cool hair, though. <laughs> so, uh, and then... And so I'll show you an image of my my abdomen to show you at that time I did not have visceral fat. So I was looking uh, radiographically on the scan quite good. I hadn't had uh, visceral fat at that time. But the damage of this came from the decades of the visceral fat that was there before. Now, three years later, uh, in the absence of visceral fat, now the way I'm living, the here's... The prop, one of the most important things I'll say in this whole podcast, visceral fat interferes with and inhibits awesomeness to your body, how your body is going to improve to the extent that it is there. So basically, it's the bad guy inside that rips you off when you go to the gym and you lift weights or you go in a sauna and you do a cold shower or you're eating clean, visceral fat eliminates the full benefit that you'd otherwise get. Now, how do we know this? Because in young people that don't have much visceral fat, they get full benefits. Hmm. That's why when they lift weights, 17-year-olds, they put on all this muscularity. But then when a 6-year-old guy or a 50-year-old woman starts lifting weights, they don't get nearly return. And it's not because you're old. It's because you have visceral fat. And it rips you off. So now, in the second image here, in the absence of visceral fat, when I start lifting, when I do sprinting, when I do asana, I have this fantastic improvement. My abdomen's yeah. gotten flat. My definition's improved. My vascularity. Look at the changes in my my veins. So here's um, the consequence of what it looks like in a 50 year old male who uh, has lifted now and benefited from uh, the absence of visceral fat. So here I am 55, here I am 59, and look at the muscle mass yeah. that I put on because I did not have visceral fat when I was lifting here. But doesn't lifting also reduce the visceral fat? It like does. So you're right. So you're asking the question, well, the, the, and I get that from time to time. Should I, does that mean if I'm not going to get any benefit? No, you will get rid of the visceral fat but you just won't put on the muscle as quickly. But mm. you're not going to be getting back. This is the fountain of youth. When you get rid of that visceral fat, you, I mean, you, you look turn. phenomenal here, by the way. Well, well, thank you. You know, all credit to nature. This is, you know, uh, I, I did not really have to exercise very hard, you know, to do. I actually did exercise very hard, but not very long. But these, I'm telling you, if you're 50, you're 40, even in your, you're in your 30s, you're most likely working out a lot harder because it's visceral fat you can think of as like an anchor that you're dragging around and it's interfering with your body's response. But this is a breeze. Hmm. Once I get clients to lose their visceral fat, they so they move ahead so much more quicker in life. Their quality of living is better. They look better. They perform better. So no testosterone, no hormones. I've never taken any of that. No gear at all. All natural. All natural. All natural. Natty. Never, yeah, never had to take any any prescription, nothing at all. It's all just 100% natty. But you're saying, so the, you're saying that visceral fat basically preempts your ability to put on muscle, but isn't visceral fat uh, more, isn't it better to think of visceral fat more as a symptom of low muscle mass? Um, better think of uh, visceral fat as uh, a, 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 a form of chronic disease that interferes with your ability to put on muscle mass. Mm. 
So it really behaves more as uh, interference and inhibition uh, than a symptom of it. So you do see uh, muscle atrophy and uh, sarcopenia and then very significantly loss of performance. So what I mean by the loss of performance is um, in this particular image here, uh, my muscles are not performing well. And you see my abdomen sticking out there? Literally. Yeah, you're skinny fat. I cannot. There's no fat in there. I, my muscles can't hold my guts in anymore. Mm-hmm. And now, look at that flat abdomen. <laughs> the same guts are being held in by those muscles. So when we do abdominal exams, and my clients, when they come in, and I'm doing an abdominal exam, like, you know, these are, these are hands trained to, you know, see if you got a surgical belly, whether, you, you know, what's going on in that abdomen. People with a lot of visceral fat, their muscle performance is so bad, you, we can push all the way down to their aortas and even to their vertebral bodies. I mean, I can go down to their back. Their abdomen is nice and soft. But if you're 17, you're 16, you're 18, and you're, you don't have a lot of visceral fat and more influence of that visceral fat, those muscles are so tight. When we press down, uh, we can barely feel you know, somebody's appendix. You know, we can barely feel their colon because of the tonicity of that. So how else does that express? Well, um, you know, when you pee, if you're listening today and you start passing gas, guess what? You didn't do that when you're a little kid. You're doing that because your muscle performance is declining. Hmm. And so relaxation of your puborectalis muscle now is causing you to pass gas when you pee. Only this is so slow that you haven't really picked up on it. So why is this happening? Visceral fat. The inflammatory molecules that get released by visceral fat start decreasing your muscle performance. And the end stage of this, if you haven't thought about this, is called adult diapers, Mm. incontinence. And this is why grandma and grandpa make noise when they get up out of the couch. It's not that they're old. Not every grandma and grandpa does this. The ones that never have got visceral fat don't make this noise. So we'll show you an interesting picture of a 60-year-old. Now, this is not a client of mine. This is somebody who I found on the internet. Uh, her, na- her name is uh, Carolyn LeBouchier. So this is a client exam filled with visceral fat. And let's look at Carolyn's MRI. I called up Carolyn, messaged her through Instagram. I said, hey, I'm a researcher. I can tell you're a very healthy lady. And would you consider, for the sake of your followers, getting an MRI? This woman was so awesome, Max. She went to a hospital and got an MRI scan so we could show, uh, I could tell she had low visceral fat. Now look at this abdomen. So a healthy abdomen is mostly dark. Visceral fat is white. Do you see any white in there? No, very little. This woman is filled with muscle and almost no visceral fat. Mm -hmm. This client is filled with visceral fat. So let's look at the the picture of this of this uh, uh, of this uh, lady, Carolyn. Look at her abdomen. Look at her legs. She's fifty nine years old. She's beautiful. Beautiful. She's so I told her because so I didn't want to look like a weirdo. You're very healthy, <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, Carolyn is a model. Wow. She's got seven hundred thousand followers, and the reason she looks that way is she has been uh, low carb eating Atkins for about four decades. Hmm. So she has never eaten, you know, sugary processed carbs. She stayed at Atkins when it first came out. And look at that benefit. Wow. So really diet preserves um, your youthfulness, your appearance, your performance, your, your, your muscle tonicity, because you don't accumulate that visceral fat, which would otherwise accelerate your aging. Wow. So if you look at people that are older, and they look attractive, or the other term is they look healthy, it's going to be because of an absence of visceral fat. And so when we scan people, we see that uh, consistently. Hmm. So is it fair to say that when when a physician measures your waist circumference, that's a very nonspecific test. It doesn't make the distinction between subcutaneous fat and the more pernicious, dangerous fat that we're talking about, the visceral yeah, fat. Yeah, so that's a great point. So a good image that we can take a look at to help help your followers understand that is um, through this. Let me scan down here to this uh, uh, image right here. Um, it's sort of like, I mean, the okay, analogy so. that I would draw is like a, a person's BMI. Like on average, 
you know, if, if you hit the BMI of an obese person, you're likely obese. However, there are outliers like The Rock or somebody who's very well muscled who might have an obese BMI, but clearly they're not obese. They're just well muscled. So similarly with waist circumference, it usually is going to indicate the, the, the high probability of there being visceral adiposity, but not, that's not necessarily the case. No. So you have a uh, difference of subcutaneous fat. So an individual that has a lot of subcutaneous fat will have a large waist circumference, hmm. but they won't have a lot of visceral fat. So you want to look at the specific ratios of subcutaneous fat, uh, to, um, um, to uh, uh, visceral fat. So mm -hmm. another good example like of a, of a very obese person would be in this, this image right here. So we see a huge amount of subcutaneous fat in this person here. So all this white on the outside is subcutaneous fat. So you can have, um, we don't have, I don't have a really good example of it because none of my clients have been this way, but there's there's a type of individual that you're referring to is called a FOTI. So they're fat outside and thin inside. FOTI, right? FOTI, yeah. yeah. So fat outside, thin inside. Now this person is actually, um, they're just a both, they're a faux fi, fat outside and fat inside. Mm. But this the uh, dramatic amount of visceral fat inside this, this abdomen here also points out another interesting biomarker. So love handles. Love handles become a proxy for how much visceral fat you have. So if you're wondering how much visceral fat you have and you, you, you don't have time right now and you, you want to get a quick read is reach back and see or get a photograph of your back. So these are the love handles right here. And specifically, do you see that black line going through there? Yeah. That black line is called scarpus fascia. And so it's this membrane that separates subcutaneous fat. So you're probably wondering, why, why do we have a membrane separating subcutaneous fat? Well, as it turns out, these two compartments, deep subcutaneous fat, which is from scarpus fascia, that membrane to the muscles, that's deep subcutaneous fat, is really bad stuff. And it always corresponds to the amount of visceral fat you have. So it becomes a proxy, another metric, for uh, allowing us to infer how much visceral fat that you have. And superficial subcutaneous fat, which is from your skin to the scarpus membrane, is, is very superficial. Now, there are bricks and clouds difference, Max, between the two. The deep subcutaneous fat also secretes the same inflammatory molecules that visceral fat does. Mm. So it causes all this harm. But the superficial subcutaneous fat doesn't. It actually secretes a really cool molecule that I hope I turn you on to called adiponectin. I was going to guess that. Yeah. So adiponectin is this awesome molecule that reduces your mortality from cardiovascular disease, uh, fatty liver, uh, cancer, and other forms of chronic disease. So you want adiponectin. And this is why some of you that are listening today are aware that there is an association between the amount of fat you have, particularly subcutaneous fat, with your level of health. There's this protective nature. Now, this is interesting that, in my opinion, bodybuilders who are working to put on muscle mass are also endeavoring to eliminate their subcutaneous fat. And this is where I think bodybuilders are cutting themselves short. It is a competition of appearance, not a competition of health. And while they do enjoy good health, they're not fully optimizing their health because they're eliminating that superficial fat. Mm. And when I was a little kid, uh, the Tarzan character that was very popular was played by an actor called Johnny Weissmuller. Uh, he probably died before you were born, Max. <laughs> but Johnny had a great build, but he had a thin layer of subcutaneous fat. So bodybuilders of old maintained that subcutaneous fat, and they were fantastically healthy. So uh, what I would say to an individual today, anybody listening, if you want to optimize your health, in other words, reduce the amount of disease that you have, and improve the quality of your life, then you want to focus in on both building muscle, eliminating the dangerous fat like visceral fat and these deep subcutaneous fat, the love handles, while maintaining a good healthy amount of superficial subcutaneous fat. But we have not worked out in the research realm 
exactly how much do you want to have? So there's probably a Goldilocks answer that unfortunately I'm not able to tell you. So I maintain a thin layer, uh, not much, just a thin layer of subcutaneous fat, superficial subcutaneous fat, while working really to get rid of this. Now you can see also the huge amount, whoops, the huge amount of fat that is uh, also deposited in this individual's muscle. So again, that's the, the, the three bad types of fat that you don't want to have is fat in your muscle, we call myosteatosis, uh, visceral fat, the fat deep in your abdomen, and the third one we talked about is deep subcutaneous fat. Mm. And uh, you know, if you're unable to afford an MRI, you can you can infer the amount of visceral fat you have because it will increase your abdominal diameter by laying down and doing a ruler and measuring how much your abdomen sticks up. Mm. And so that's one measurement. I that is more accurate than doing a a, a, a measurement of uh, circumference because circumference will, will have be uh, increased, unfortunately, by subcutaneous fat. Yeah, so, it's like nonspecific. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. That's, that is the – rock on. <laughs> that is it, man. So are you a fan – there's a lot of um, talk now of these full-body MRIs, and I actually recently did one. I wish I had the images to show you. Yeah, but, man. But I was gifted it by um, a company called Prenuvo, and I have no commercial affiliation with them. I do not get a commission from this, but they've uh, they gave me a, a link to share with my followers as sort of a um, bargaining chip, uh, if you will, because they comped it for me. But if you go to pranuvo.com slash max, you'll get $300 off a full body MRI. And again, I get zero commission from that. I'm just offering it to my listeners. But are you saying that that's something worth doing for your average person? Yeah, so hmm. um, tr truthful disclosure, um, I just had my full body MRI at Pernuvo yesterday. As oh, a matter of fact, amazing, dude! Yeah, wow. So, yeah, I have no commercial affiliation, but yeah. they were very kind. Yeah, same with me. In the sense that they gifted it to me, and I I saw that I had very little visceral yeah. fat. My muscles looked nice and black. Yeah, man. On the on the imagery. So, first of all, let me compliment you for not having a financial relationship. I don't have one either, but you know, I'm just going to look at the, wherever the cameras influencers. Right we yeah. need more people that are influencers who are willing to tell you about something good and not because they're going to get compensated for it. So I love Max. That <laughs> is awesome. And I'm the same way. I don't have a code yet. I might get a code, you know, so that I can help influence my followers to be able to do the same thing. Cause I think it is a very good idea to get a full body MRI. Um, I think uh, Pernuvo um, is learning. They're studying internally about visceral fat. Um, I don't think it's something that all of their radiologists are really doing a, uh, the, the same great job about reading visceral fat. I don't know if they spent much. Did they talk to you about visceral fat in your scan, um, if you remember? I don't recall specifically, but I do remember talking about body my body composition, okay. and I got— an A plus. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm not surprised. I'm happy to take a look at your image. And, yeah, I'll and, send uh, it to you. Yeah, man. I'd like to see it. I That'd would be, be surprised. So, cool. so um, but when it comes to, I think these full body scans, uh, you can ask specifically about your visceral fat. You can you you should look at it. Uh, the the impact of these visual images are very significant for motivating individual to make change. Now, in your case when I have clients that come looking like you and have um, low amounts of visceral fat, there's not as much of a motivation other than you, you pat yourself in the back and you know, do good. But if you have this amount of visceral fat going on your inside of you and then you get scanned, it's, it's highly significant. It's a big wake up call. So in this, in this particular image here, I'll just go back to this one guy, his image, cause it, it's an interesting story. This guy came in to me and he got scanned, and he didn't have, he's a tofi, so he did not have, he was thin outside, fat inside. He did not have a lot of subcutaneous fat that he could feel. So he imagined himself incorrectly, assumed that he was very healthy. And when he got scanned, and we showed him images before we showed him his images of what looks good and what looks bad, a good MRI scan with low visceral fat, a bad MRI scan with a lot of visceral fat. And then we opened up his scan. This guy actually passed out. He fainted on me, hit the floor. Whoa. And so as a, as a real consideration to prevent this ever from happening again, because the guy scared the heck out of me when he passed out. I thought he was having a heart attack. Um, 
I was ready to start CPR, and I'm, I checked his pulses. Fortunately, he had a pulse. Is is because it got so scared when he saw that visceral fat. So mm-hmm. this dude completely changed his life. I mean, this is all white. This image. Yeah. So is that all? Fat? All visceral fat. Wow. Yeah. So you want to be like Caroline, you know, that mostly dark. That's all muscle and organs inside of you. And this guy is mostly white. So uh, on my YouTube channel, I have videos where I explain people. You know how to read uh, their MRI, and I do lots of examples. So if you're listening today and you want more information, like how to read, you know, visceral fat in your skin, and the reason why I I, I, I make that offer is because, in most cases, in virtually every single case, the MRIs when they're done and CTs of the abdomen, no reading of visceral fat will take place. Hmm. And so Pranuvo, I think, is um, internalizing the, the importance of visceral fat. And I think that's going to be probably standardized by them to make sure they do it. But conventionally, um, most people that go in there uh, are looking for cancer. Now, uh, I really think Pranuvo needs to change their focus from being a, a, a cancer, you know, uh, detecting service to one where you go in and say, do, how do I change my life for the better? Hmm. Do I have things inside of me that need to change? And if you uh, are just getting CPT coded disease instead of something like visceral fat and myosteatosis, fatty infiltrate in your muscles, you're not learning about these other things that would actually tell you that you you have not lived your your life well. You you are poor. So a good example of that kind of scenario is from I this. keep I keep noticing this steak image that you have <laughs> yeah your, in your library so I'll 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 show you that right after this one so this guy is is uh has got a huge amount of visceral fat and this guy has absolutely no visceral fat and look at these beautiful muscles you know you, you this guy you compared to you were an F compared to this guy probably max hmm. this guy is the single greatest abdominal scan I've ever seen looks like a bodybuilder he's he's a he's in fact a a Olympic sprinter oh, wow. so if we look at his legs the, these beautiful legs cross section through his egg legs he has no fatty infiltration no fatty replacement of his muscle it's just pure filet mignon in his legs just <laughs> like it is in his abdomen his visceral fat is just that little teeny tiny white bit right there compared to this guy here now look at this guy's legs <clears throat> this these legs are like your um, your uh, akashi beef or your wagyu beef <laughs> you know so he's he's got all that marbleized legs uh, muscle mar- marbleization in his legs of his muscle and w- just imagine um you know if you're listening today what this guy's legs would be like his quality of life in his 70s and 80s now he's only he's only in his 50s now what causes the fat to spill over into these non-professional storage sites like your muscle tissue like your you know organs um is it because our fat stores have essentially overfilled and there's like a, uh, I've heard it sometimes referred to as a, a personal fat threshold. Yeah. Is that? Is yeah. That, so I agree with I... Dr. Ben Bickman. Um, mm. Dr. Bickman, I think is doing um, really great work in regard to the mechanisms uh, for which uh, uh, adiposity is occurring. And, in, and I agree with him that it's not so much increased numbers of cells, but they simply are so large and they're so filled with uh, fatty content within them uh, that they're spilling over, and we're having this as as a problem. But you know, we can get, um, I think, distracted almost by trying to perfect an awareness of the exact mechanisms. And I'm not sure that we'll ever get complete granularity on those mechanisms. And I think, you know, I for for one, I'm trying to be an influencer to tell people what they got to do to change that. And so anecdotally, you know, through 6,000 people, we saw um, visceral fat. We learned what eliminated visceral fat. And so I put it, I pinned the majority of the strategies, the big ones, uh, on my Instagram account. And I also have my YouTube videos. And so, you, you, you know, my followers can go there and start eliminating visceral fat. And mm-hmm. then I do hold on to some 
you know, I got 47 others because I'm trying to entice people to come and work with me to study them who can afford to have serial MRIs and track over a period of time so that um, I have a, a continued body of motivated people to, to work with and, and study the very best strategies. And it's my intention to write a book uh, eventually so I can just give this away so that people understand all that. But nobody will come to me if I put away put, put out my 47 strategies. The other thing is um, people want me to. Guess what? You're not going to do it. I put those 47 strategies in there. They won't do it. Why? Because they're not motivated. They say, you don't have to do all those 47 things. Hmm. But if you come to me and you're filled with visceral fat like that, if I put down 100, you're going to do them. Hmm. Because now you see all this disease going on and you have legs looking like this. It's a wake-up call. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Now you may not because you're, you're going to be looking good. Um, you, you're, I've, I'm looking forward to seeing you because I agree you're going to have an oval shaped abdomen. You're going to be mostly dark. You're going to be filled with very nice, uh, lean muscles without, you know, fatty replacement. No, none of the myosteatosis that we see. And I'm sure your legs would look, uh, nice and lean. So yeah, getting back to that full body MRI that Pernuvo offers, I think it's a great way, but I think they, they need to look at using their service as a ways to optimize people, improve their quality of life, instead of just saying, I almost look at them as uh, Valium. Hmm. You know, they just relieve people's anxiety that you don't have cancer. Well, you know, I don't want to know that I just don't have cancer. I want you to tell me how I can live and improve the quality of my life for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's what Pernuvo could do if they make an adjustment from being that cancer detecting, disease detecting service to want to a service that says, hey, you come into Pernuvo and we literally will optimize your life. Well, the great thing about it, they gave me all of my imagery. They gave me the, yeah. the images so I yeah. could easily take those and send them to uh, you know, a, a more muscle, a doctor with a more muscle centric approach such yeah. as yourself. Yeah. To have you, you yeah. know, inter- interpret them. Yeah, and so cool. you know, in regard to interpretation, um, when as a physician, I can only interpret an MRI study in a state that I'm licensed. So mm. uh, that's why I require a lot of people wonder why why do I have to come see you, Doctor Sean, in Minnesota? Why do you have to come? Because that's where my license is. I can't practice uh, yet. In You're the also state a lawyer, California. right? I am. Yeah, I was a lawyer. You're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I. Uh, I did practice law for three years before into medicine. I, I finally arrived, Max. I love what I do. And, you know, if you're listening today, and I can tell Max less what he does, you need to do a job that you love doing. Mm. And I, my passion in life is to help people improve and optimize their health and, <clears throat> and their, their quality of life. So that's, that's what I do. And you have to come to me to see me in Minnesota. That's where I'm licensed. But I'm applying for licensure to expand our practice. Full disclosure, uh, Dr. Sean is not just a, a sole practitioner. We're a startup now, and we're going to be expanding to California, Arizona, Texas. Our next uh, expansion site will be in Florida, and we hope to open probably by the uh, the third quarter of 2024. Hmm. We should be up and, and operating and, and seeing clients in Florida. So, hmm. uh, What's the difference between the data that you might get from an MRI compared to what uh, the data that you get from a DEXA scan, for example? Yeah, so really good. So a uh, DEXA scan will give you numbers, so quantification. But it doesn't give you, it gives you some imagery, but it won't image your visceral fat. The other thing it won't image is your myosteatosis. So you won't get these great motivating uh, p- images that show how much disease you have inside your body. So it gives you a number. So what I like to give as an example why it's not so motivating is if I put down a crypto wallet in front of you that had a billion dollars in it, and I said, Max, dude, you were the best podcast host I've ever been on. I'm filthy rich. I'm giving you $1 billion. Cryptocurrency, you got these numbers. But suppose I take you out and say, Max, you were the best podcast host I've ever been on, and I'm giving you those seven $500 million houses, and I'm giving you behind their bay our slips for each $450 million Fed ships, yachts, and in those driveways were 10 Maseratis and 20 Ferraris. Now you're getting your senses are a lot more engaged, and you're a lot more moved by the same amount of money that was involved. And so it's the, my point is about a DEXA scan is they quantify it. It's just a number. Hmm. 
But and so it's just like looking at crypto wallet. But when you do that MRI, it's like looking at the houses, looking at those uh, Fed ships, those Tangible. yachts. Tangible. It's scintillating to your senses. So what I have found as a health and performance optimizer physician is if I want to increase the health, the performance, and the appearance, and the life of an individual, I must engage them with information through their senses, that they're processing through their senses, not cortically just through a digit. So numbers really don't improve people. And a good example of this is cholesterol. You got the whole country basically chasing numbers, lipids, and uh, cholesterol numbers, and nobody's getting better. Nobody changes their lives. But when you chase visceral fat, uh, in my opinion, in no other biomarker will have a greater impact on improving the level of health somebody has and reducing the amount of disease then following through visualization, getting an MRI scan of visceral fat. So don't chase numbers. You want to look at disease. You want to stare at the enemy within. That's how you're going to take him or her out is looking at them. And it's not through numbers. Very interesting. Let's go back to the, um, the, the dietary strategy to reduce or prevent the accumulation of visceral fat. You talked about processed foods. What makes processed foods so... Uh, pernicious from the standpoint of belly fat. Yeah. So one of the things I think that happens with uh, changing the form of something is it renders it less digestible and more inflammatory. So I think oxidation is more uh, vulnerable and more likely to happen when you change that form. So for instance, if you take uh, vegetables and you process them, uh, you add chemicals to them, uh, you chop them up, um, you add oils, all of that contributes to um, the, their ability to be more inflammatory within your gut and destructive than the microbiome. So here's a very interesting thing that I picked up in, on this point of oxidation that I'll share with your followers. And I don't think I've ever actually shared this um, in a podcast, but it, it's, it's worth doing. Mm. So um, these are called sebaceous filaments, these little dark dots. Blackheads. Now, well, a lot of people think of them as blackheads. Technically, from a dermatological standpoint, that's what the dermatology say, um, blackheads are clocked. These aren't clocked. So these are pores, um, but do you know why they're dark? It's not because they're, they're clogged. It's because they're oxidized. Ooh, interesting. So what this means is, you can go to your mirror and look at your sebaceous filaments, and by the way, everybody has them. They're less noticeable if you're healthy. They're more noticeable if you're not. Mm. So if you're metabolically unhealthy, what I figured out is the oil oxidizes and becomes dark. Whoa. And this is why when you are 16 years old and you're going in for your first kiss, and if you saw a bunch of these black dots, you would recall and push away because imprinting, your biology would say, I'm not going there. Whoa. Not good. But if that nose happened to be covered with dirt, you know, because they were a farmer or whatever, it wouldn't bother you. But nature tells you that's not a good look. It's oxidation. <laughs> so stay away from processed foods. My clients, we take photographs of them and we look at their sebaceous filaments. We record it and it goes away as we reduce the amount of inflammation change their diet. So yeah, this is a great biomarker. People should be following that instead of cholesterol and numbers that you know, their doctors telling them they should be paying attention to. You're sharing all these very interesting signs. Flatulence while peeing, <laughs> what appear to be blackheads are actually a sign of, of oxidation. There's also a relationship between uh, the presence of skin tags right? Yeah. And insulin resistance. Yeah. So skin tags also inform, uh, form in people's bodies. And it's interesting about skin tags is they tend to form around strategic sites that are attached to significant decision-making uh, points with regard to reproduction, i.e. we're talking about sex. So around necks, in the axilla, people's armpits, and in their groins. So if somebody has skin tags, that is somebody who is metabolically unwell, and they're going to have a lot of visceral fat. And these skin tags will rescind, go away, if you get rid of that visceral fat. And I will confess that I formerly had these skin tags when I was an overweight, 
uh, visceral fat filled physician. Hmm. And uh, I'm so glad that they went away. So um, getting rid of your visceral fat will cause them to go away. So basically, if you have a feature that's unattractive, it is because you have some sort of a manifestation of disease and you're unhealthy. So another interesting biomarker that we can... That it's we so can, true. Health is attractive. Yes. And ill health is unattractive. Yeah, it really is. It almost case. feels like a, like it's not politically correct to say that. No. Like we shouldn't be saying that. No. But it's true. No, you want to be attractive. Listen, when you are attractive, it means you're living your life well. And if you're living your life well, you can help other people live your life well. Because biologically, biologically, our species is meant to live together as a clan. I tell my clients, we got to hang together. So I have a client group and we all hunt biological optimization. You, we all hunt together. If you're a lone wolf trying to do this by yourself, you're not gonna hunt as well. So another biomarker that I'm interested in are, are spider veins. The technical term for that are telangiectasias. But women have spider veins oftentimes in abundance on their legs, and they tend to accumulate not with age, but with visceral fat. So the more visceral fat you have over a period of time, the, the more these spider veins you get. Now, women get them on their legs, but guys, guys get them on the skin of their penis. So women, when they get, I know the, I noticed the reaction, yeah, man. Women hate spider veins on their legs, and they're running around vein clinics of America to get their, their spider veins removed. Now, why is this happening in guys' penises? Here, it's because it basically is advertising, you know, uh, for our species propagation, for species reproduction. This one is unhealthy. Hmm. He has unhealthy genetic material. He's not going to pass on good. And so it is very unattractive. Now, it's probably a more convenient place that nature could have put them. Right? Yeah. Because by the could time have, you're seeing But it's an you're important one. Them. It's an important one. So, you know, it really will, will spoil the moment if uh, so a 16 year old male's penis will be very clean, won't have, it'll have nice tan skin. A 60 year old male, let me just tell you, because everybody's got downsized the job. It looks like a purple sausage from those spider veins all over it. Now, here's the cool People thing. People are going to be going home tonight looking at their partners. Yeah, they will. Junk. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. But I guess so, it's a good thing. Uh, but if, you, you know, if you're a 60 year old guy and yours looks like a purple sausage, if you do these strategies, you get rid of your visceral fat, they go away. Then you get, you get skin on your penis that looks more like a 16-year-old. Whoa. And so it's blood flow, cardiovascular improvement. And so as the venous stasis, the, the static, the slowing down of blood in your capillaries starts accumulating, you get these spider veins. And they're uh, a really strong sign that you have poor cardiovascular health. And then as far as performance goes, you get a soft erection. Mm. You don't have the ability because you don't have this very dynamic perfusion going on with within your 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 penis and all over your body. So erectile dysfunction is really an emergency. It's a wake up call that you're at risk for having a heart attack, a stroke, you have declining blood flow throughout your body. And so in my clients who lose those spider veins, they improve the skin appearance. Women lose their spider veins, they get stronger erections. And the, the other really interesting aspect to uh, the first sign of erectile dysfunction is actually not softening. But when you were 16, 17, 18 years old, you had an erection that bounced like this. Hmm. And so my clients, what we noticed is the return, they get their erections back and then they start bouncing again. Hmm. And so the urologists aren't touting this, but this is what I'm touting. Get rid of your visceral fat and you'll have an erection that bounces with every heartbeat. So that is reliable indications, inferences that you can you can you can take home at bank on that your blood flow is improving if you you get first a hard erection and the erection starts bouncing and the other visible other aspect that you can see we see are visible pulses so yeah i don't think it will show up on camera but you you can see my massive pulse in my arm there i can see it yeah yeah so i get these visible pulses all over my body and my clients get them. So they, they go from having no visible pulses to getting pulses. Isn't that just also the result of low subcutaneous fat? Yeah, not well? really. Because no. you can get people with low subcutaneous fat and they're filled with visceral fat and perform. they have 
uh, erectile dysfunction, and they don't have visible pulses. And so, um, and it's really less about the subcutaneous fat, and here's why. If you lay um, one of my clients down that has no visceral fat, and if I lay down here, I won't do it in the middle of the show, you'll see my admin pulses up. Mm. And my admin's pulsing up because the blood coursing through my aorta. But there's a huge amount of tissue, my colon, everything covering that up. And so it's not the presence of something covering up. It's the lack of perfusion, the lack of performance going through there. So you want massive optimized blood flow going through your arteries. And so a good way of seeing that reliably is one, visible pulses. And to another sign is skin turgor. So how fast your skin snaps up and mm. back when you uh, pull it up. And, and what's interesting is once you get rid of visceral fat, your skin turgor improves. But another really interesting fact that I figured out is through nitric oxide. Mm. So if you start sprinting, Max, and you check your skin turgor before you sprint, you check your skin turgor after you sprint, you'll see that your skin turgor have improved. Sunshine, the sauna, and fasting will also improve your skin turgor, improve your spider veins. You can look at your spider ta- spider veins, take pictures uh, of your junk before you, sp- you go into a uh, sprint, before you go into sauna, before you start fasting. And, uh, uh, and you'll see that your, your spider veins will improve. And the, the third aspect that you see are these visible pulses. So skin turgor, spider veins, and visible pulses all improve through nitric oxide when you do those, those, four, those four things, fasting, sunshine, sprinting, and asana, mm-hmm. because they all increase nitric oxide. But dermatologists have people terrified of going out in the sunshine. So if you look at your spider veins, you look at your skin turgor, you look at your pulses before you go out in the sunshine, and then you see that those are enhanced after you've been out in the sunshine, you will be more likely to hang out in the sunshine because now you see that your blood flow is improving, and it's a good thing. But, you know, unfortunately, conventional healthcare has this terrified of sunshine. They're trying to terrify us now of beef, and I'm just going to call it. The next thing they're going to be having us terrified of is water. Don't drink water. You need to drink this laboratory created liquid that we've come up with that's going to take care of you and will help you be healthier. That's what's going to happen. They have <laughs> us terrified of things that are good for us. Uh, but you have to have an appreciation for how these things are actually improving you and pay attention uh, to how you are improving. Otherwise, I fear that people will be sadly making decisions poorly mm. uh, for their health and their lifestyle about abandoning some of these things that we have evolved to uh, benefit the most from, mm. water and meat. Wow, water and meat. And sunshine. And sunshine. Yeah. What's the relationship between with uh, sunshine and nitric oxide production? Yeah, so through uh, sunshine hitting the endothelial cells, you get production of nitric oxide. Whoa. So two things that the healthier you are, the more you produce nitric oxide. And so, and the more likely it is that you, you engage in those kind of things. So nitric oxide, if you're following this awesome podcast, is something that you want to write down and read about and, and, and look for ways to increase, uh, to optimize your, your body. Because it's, when it comes to real estate, they say it's location, location, location. When it comes to health, it's perfusion, perfusion, perfusion. <laughs> you want blood flow, massive blood flow. And let me just make the point. Check out Max's lips compared to my lips. Max got these very bright red lips. He's perfusing his lips really well. Interesting. Young people, young healthy people have these have very red lips. Like they 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 look like they have lipstick on. <laughs> and the number one selling lipstick color, you know, throughout all time is red. Mm. And it's because women know it attracts men. It's and a sign of health. Yeah, we're attracted to because we think that that's good genetic material to merge, to merge our good genetic material. And same thing with nail beds, fingernails and toenails. Red is that color. So, mm. you know, what we need more of are physicians willing to teach these really important biomarkers that we should be paying attention to instead of the ones that are really good at making money like cholesterol lipid panels where there's CPT coding and and revenue attached to it. So pay attention to your natural signs on your body, how you improve. 
you you have some of the reddest lips of any podcaster I've been on, man. Oh man, You're rocking it, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Well, I, I do take good good care of myself. <laughs> yes, you do. So uh, I'm glad that it shows. I'm f- I'm fascinated by all of these signs that you're that you're sharing with us. One that I came across, um, which I'm hoping you could speak to, is Frank's sign. Are you familiar with that? It's the crease in the earlobe. Oh yeah, yeah. So Frank's sign is has been uh, studied quite a bit. Um, I think it's. Uh, um, there is a strong association between uh, Frank sign and cardiovascular disease. But in my opinion, when I show it to clients and share it, it does improve over a period of time in people. Your earlobes you know, look they, great. You no, know, well, thank you. Yeah. As, uh, as they improve. And some of them really have very strong signs of it. But um, in my experience, it doesn't seem to be as motivation, motivating of a, of a biomarker fall as much as spider veins on, on women's legs and spider veins on, on guys' penises and, uh, and then skin tags and, uh, uh, and then, and then uh, declining skin health. So there are so many of these things that I think we need to pay attention to. And I actually uh, collect them because uh, I educate clients when they come to ha- how to take photographs of them. And then I want to build an electronic medical record. I wow. want to create software that when – uh, physicians, when patients go to a, uh, a, a healthcare practice, that they, the, the healthcare practice is using an EMR that actually optimizes the patient instead of optimizing the revenue. Right mm-hmm. now, the software is all written through clicks. You know, you basically had a 15 minute encounter with a physician, four minutes in front of him or her. Uh, they're doing all the clicks, uh, and then 11 minutes is, uh, is, is where they really do the clicks in the back room to make as much money for themselves, for their medical practice, for their, their health care system, and for the insurance companies. It's all designed not to optimize you, but to optimize the system. Nobody has ever written a single EMR that actually optimizes human beings, and that's, that's what I'd like my startup to be able to do, one of many things that we hope to to do by just changing the focus off of instead of trying to build the best healthcare system, let's build the best humans. Let's look at how we can take a human being and make them the healthiest biological version of themselves possible. Hmm. I love that we've revealed a medical purpose for taking a dick pic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which I, I, <laughs> that was not on my 2023 uh, yeah. bingo card Yeah. Uh, for the Genius Life, but... Here we are. Yeah, no, that's a really, I mean, and it really is a pretty good marker. You before and after, you'll see that you'll significantly improve that. So, yeah, there'll be a lot of people out uh, very concerned about their own skin and their partner's skin uh, yeah. as a consequence of that. I, I know what I'm, <laughs> I'm. I know what I'm doing after uh, after we record the podcast. There's also a relationship between visceral fat and face shape. I've heard you talk about. Yeah. What's that about? Yeah. So that's another photograph that I do, and I, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of just uh, myself because I think uh, this is this is important. So this is a picture of my face, um, age 48, when I when I had a lot of visceral fat. So uh, what's interesting is visceral fat. One of its most significant impacts is on your face, and so you get this inflammatory response. The inflammation starts affecting your face. And what after you know scanning six thousand people and working with thousands of people to eliminate visceral fat, what happens is people's faces adopt the shape of what they formerly had uh, in the absence of visceral fat when you get rid of it. So when you're around 16, 17, 18 years old, you get a much you have a much leaner face, and then you slowly accumulate visceral fat, and the consequence of that visceral fat through those inflammatory molecules causes an inflammatory edematous look. Of your face and actually we see when we scan through there fat pads deep inflammatory fat that starts forming uh, around people's faces and around their heads and so you can see this uh, dramatic change in my appearance I don't even look like the same person uh, in this in the in this in these two photographs and you actually you weigh more just yeah. for listeners you weigh more on the side where your face appears leaner yes I weigh more, so I'm Which actually lighter here. So what happens is, is not the weight you lose, but the tissue you lose. Hmm. And the MRI uh, will not lie. It tells you and shows you exactly the type of tissue you lose. And what you want to do is lose the inflammatory visceral fat. And you want to put on healthy muscle tissue. Hmm. And you also want to have good a good amount of superficial subcutaneous fat. So a really great way to improve your face 
is to eliminate that visceral fat. Now, this is really important to our species because it says, I live well, and, it, and that therefore, because I'm living well, I can help you live well. Hmm. So if you are an influencer like you are, uh, the, more, the more healthier you look and the more you portray, I live well, the more people follow you. That's why you have 1.2 million people followers following you. It's because you are, uh, you're getting the job done, you look good, and people tune into you. If you had a lot of visceral fat, you'd have inflammation in your face, and you, and you wouldn't have your ability to have as much of an influence on your followers. So, yeah, it's a great thing. Track your facial photographs and then look at these interesting uh, changes over a period of time in my face uh, here. So here I am in my 20s, my 40s, 48, and then here I am 53. Uh, I'm eliminating visceral fat, and you can see that my face has changed. And so literally the evolution of my face improves over the course of these um you know, about 12, 13 years. You literally, you've gotten better looking with time. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. I mean, honest, honest to God, if you, um, you you get your facial photographs out and you're falling apart, it's because you, you're, you're accumulating visceral fat Hmm. and take, please, please, please. If you're listening and you, and you get motivated and you get rid of your visceral fat, take pictures of your face. The same thing will happen to you. Same thing happens to my clients as they, they eliminate that visceral fat. Their faces Im- improve. And if you're in sales, you own a company, you have employees, you're a consultant, you work with clients, they will buy from you more, they will pay more attention to you and follow you. You'll just be better at your job if you get rid of visceral fat and your face looks better. Hmm. It's uniform across the board, and that's why you know I am not just a health optimizer physician, I'm a performance optimizing physician. You get people to perform better. And so they, they just get, they get better at bringing home the bacon. They become better at hunting whatever it is they do, uh, their jobs improve. And it's across the board. Even we saw this in 6,000 people. The big surprise, not so much that we could reverse chronic disease when we got visceral fat max. The big surprise was across the board, everybody, whatever they did in their life, improved. So uh, they got better in their jobs, but they got better at ping pong. They got better at playing chess. They got better at lifting weights. They got better at uh, painting or uh, singing. All their performance improved. So now as a consequence, I want to try to preserve performing arts in humanity. Mm-hmm. I want to see uh, actors and singers and dancers the, the and, and uh, artists and musicians be able to preserve their talents longer by telling them and get, preaching from the mountaintops about visceral fat so that we can have their fantastic talents to enjoy longer. And right now, you know, I grew up in the era when Elton John, you know, when I was a little kid, uh, Elton doesn't sing the way today, and it's simply because he's got visceral fat and he has myosteatosis, fatty infiltrates within his tongue, uh, this laryngeal inlet, his larynx, and his strap muscles of his, of his of his neck, and that's what happens as to performers. They their voices start declining, not because they're getting older, but because they're getting less healthy because they're accumulating that visceral fat. So if you're if you know anybody who's a famous singer, get them to me, and I will I will get them him or her uh, to to sing longer and better. Damn, certainly, yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. If you're being healthy, it's the rising tide that lifts all the boats in your harbor. Makes you a better mom or dad. It makes you a better public servant. It makes you a better professional. It makes you better at whatever it is that you enjoy doing. Dude, that's great. You know, what's interesting to me, Max, is uh, we have role models, the best basketball players, the best soccer players, the best engineers, the best architects the best singers and actors. We know who these people are. Who's the healthiest man or woman in the world? We do not have role models Hmm. for health. But here's the interesting thing. And our our health experts certainly don't portray health. No, look what's... The publicly elected health officials. Yeah, what's happening to them. (laughs) But what's... This is the imperative, and I'm glad you raised this. I think we need 
health as role models. Why? Because as good as you know a basketball player may be in inspiring young people to, to be great at basketball or maybe some other sport, they don't really influence the singer or the architect or the engineer. But a role model in health improves everybody. Hmm. And so when you are a really healthy individual, you can influence so many more people. But we gotta take this mainstream. It needs to be promoted. I, for one, think we need to have the world's healthiest man and the world's healthiest woman competition uh, and, and promote it. And everybody be tuning in why they're so healthy and why they perform so well. And you'd have corporate sponsorships and you know be big bucks in that hmm. uh, so i think you're spot on uh, i think health has that capacity to to improve everybody across the board and i'm super glad you're in this space because you're highly effective at it thanks man yeah i feel very lucky that i get to go on platforms like the today show which uh has been something that i've been doing lately i was recently on access Hollywood and I, I, oh, that's I awesome yeah I love getting to share the 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 true science of healthy living because you know on the other hand you see headlines all the time like that recent what was that recent there was a recent study out of Harvard that made huge headlines linking red meat consumption to type 2 diabetes yeah what do you make of that yeah Just senseless fear mongering yeah so there is a lot of that and there's just so much confounding especially with regard to red meat and meat consumption in general so you know they have this myopic focus where they pay attention to um, just the the association present in a particular study to a population that has disease without focusing in on the lifestyle that accumulates with all those individuals who in many cases are just self-reporting and not even accurately reporting right. what's going on. Yeah, all of these kinds of studies, they utilize food frequency questionnaires, yeah. which are notoriously unreliable. Yes, so there's a lot of unreliability and confounding frequently in those people that are admitting to meat. Uh, they're also eating a lot of processed hamburgers, processed bread, uh, beer, uh, excessive alcohol, uh, and maybe even smoking or confounding those particular studies. But uh, in people that have purpose to move away from meat, oftentimes, there's a, a positive confounding. It's still a confounder where they say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm giving up meat. So I'm also going to uh, start exercising or I'm giving up meat and I'm also going to stop uh, eating uh uh, caramel corn and candy and uh, cotton candy and ice cream. And so they start improving. Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with the meat. It has to do with all these other confounders that are going on. You know, frequently people, you know, are, are, are an unintentionally uh, polluting the results of that, that particular study. So really, when it comes down to it, I tell my clients, don't even pay attention to the studies. What really matters is the end of one where we study you and forget the other 7.9 billion other people. And oftentimes there's financial drivers behind these studies that are trying to manipulate the outcome of that study to particular outcome. So forget the studies, just see what's going on in you. Get an MRI, look at your muscles, look at your visceral fat, look at deep subcutaneous fat, look at fat around your heart and your organs and watch those things go away, watch your muscle build, watch the quality of your muscle build as you do these things, then you know reliably 100% that you're improving rather than trying to go chase after and follow every new study that comes out. They become distracting. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I sell ends of one. You know, For people that can afford to, to do a self-study, the best study in the world is the study on you. I love that. So true. And so paint then the dietary pattern for us, if you will, in terms of what we might eat, how we might eat, when we might eat to reverse, to prevent or reverse uh, the accumulation of belly fat. Yeah. So I identify myself as a carnivore physician. I'm meat centric. I eat mostly meat. Most of my calories that I'm consuming are coming from meat. I do eat vegetables and I do eat fruit. I'm a little different than other carnivore physicians and many other influencers in this really exciting you know, health space in social media, which I think is just exploding. And what a great thing. The way I differ though is my fruit and vegetables that I consume are always in fermented form. Hmm. So I have a concern about vegetables 
uh, because of the lectins, phthalates, uh, the oxalates, and these other kind of microtoxins, these other substances, they're a very small dose. Look, they're not going to kill you. I'm an emergency medicine trained physician. They, they're not going to cause you know toxicity. It's they're not sending a, you to the ER. No, but a slow period of time, you know, they can accumulate, and I think they're basically you could describe them as kind of harsh on your body. Cumulative injury. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of like uh, you know arsenic. Um, you can slowly accumulate arsenic over a period of time; it becomes problematic. Mm. So you can think of it that way. It's kind of this these undesirable molecules get added. But if you ferment these vegetables, it eliminates the threat from these particular harsh molecules and other other content that come into vegetables. And so they it renders them in a much safer form. And it also, Max, improves the the uh, the, the the nutrition, not so much the nutritional value, but the microbial value of that food. So now you have these beneficial microbes. So the microbiome is another area. In fact, I'll just come out and say, it is my number one strategy. My number one target is visceral fat. My number one strategy to eliminate visceral fat is through the microbiome. So I work with my clients to educate them how to optimize their microbiome and basically get them to understand that their mission for the rest of their life is simply to collect the most beneficial number of microbes that they can possibly get and to eliminate the least amount. And this is, whether you recognize it or not, is part of nature. So a good example of this is what happens um, that you see visibly uh, right now in sports competitions. So people who um, are professional athletes, if you watch what happens uh, during a sports competition, you will see that an athlete that does something very significant, the other athletes will go up and they'll high five and they'll do uh, chest bumps on these individuals. And what what is really happening with those individuals like this, they're collecting microbes from each other. Interesting. So that's, that's really biologically what's happening. And uh, the other... Uh, place that you know this happens is is you see this maybe in the office uh hair somebody does something awesome you rub their hair because your hair is where your microbes are stored to protect you so when you go in the the beach out here into the pacific your your microbiome washes off your skin and the ability to replenish your microbiome which is your signature it is your awesomeness how well you've lived your life what you've done is stored in that hair it propagates quickly over your skin because it's stored in here when you get out of that water. And I like to impress upon my clients that when you actually engage in reproduction, it is simply all of the microbes that you lived in your life throughout a day, You'll, as a male, you'll go and, and pee. You'll touch your skin, your foreskin with your hand with all those great microbes that you've had throughout the day, and that's stored in your foreskin until you go home and have relations with your partner. And I lost mine many years ago. You're, yeah, well, it's just still, <laughs> still on your skin and still be down there. And so you're making deposition of microbes within the vaginal vault mm. until an offspring is born and all those microbes bathe that child based on the awesomeness of the father and mother. And so we collect these microbes throughout the day. And so I educate my clients about how these these reality is uh, you know these microbes are out there and you, you're getting good ones or you're getting bad ones mm. and they influence your health in very very significant ways so it's not just touch but sitting in park benches and uh, i tell my kids and my clients never sit in those four foot wide wheelchairs that are in in airports because, because you're getting a, the microbiome a lot of, of bad ones in there whoa yeah but what you want to do is maybe be the towel boy for the U.S. Olympic ski team or gymnastics team or soccer team, you know, get their good microbes because th they'll be higher performers. Uh, than, that is than, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see people who clearly embody, exhibit good health, spend more time around them. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, as a physician, um, I, I will wear gloves on unhealthy people. And healthy people um, that have good microbes, I won't wear gloves. Whoa! So I'm I'm actually benefiting myself from that kind of thing. But you you know, birds of a feather flock together. You want to hang with healthy people. You're attracted to them 
because they, they will have a higher collection of more effective microbiomes. And we see this in fecal microbiota transplants. So people, there was a very interesting study, fecal microbiota transplants, which is taking feces from one human, putting them to another. The only indication now that we're permitted to do that as physicians in the United States from the FDA is for C. difficile infections, C. diff. And people that have this refractor C. diff, if antibiotics are no longer working, will take stool from a healthy person, put it into them. And it's in the area of we're up to around 98, 99% effective with a single FMT transplant and eliminating this infection of FMTs. But in other cases, they oftentimes people with C. diff have other diseases like Crohn's. Many people with Crohn's end up getting C. diff because the repetitive use of antibiotics lead to C. diff. So when somebody has C. diff and they get treated with an FMT, there was one study that showed out of 19 uh, people that had C. diff that, that were, were cured of Crohn's, they found that 11 of them, Max, came from a single donor. So what that means is they were a super donor, and they're euphemistically referred to as a super pooper. Hmm. So their microbiome was so powerful, they cured the recipients of Crohn's. And there is no cure for Crohn's. Crohn's is lifelong medical treatment that you get and usually oftentimes surgeries. But from a single FMT, from a very, very healthy person, we can cure disease. So in the future, we will be curing more and more diseases through stool transplant. But you are having micro FMTs when you hang with really healthy people. You're having contact with them. Like it or not, you're getting some of their feces in your mouth and your gastrointestinal tract. That's this insane. Is really teeny Gross, tiny. but also very cool. Yeah, but if they're really healthy, you want that. But the same thing with people that are unhealthy, you can also acquire their FMTs. And so if you're listening today and you have cravings for bad food, it's simply because you have microbes in you that are dependent upon those, those, that bad food, in most cases, simple carbohydrates, uh, because they will die if they don't get it. So if you cut out those carbohydrates and you eat fermented foods, you eliminate completely those, those cravings. And so I like to get people who are carnivore, get them eating fermented foods, um, and they can stay the course longer. Some people end up going carnivore for a while and then falling away. And so these fermented foods, which have been traditional in many people for thousands and thousands of years, help to sustain people, keep them away from bad carvings for bad food. And it also has this powerful addition to your microbiome so that maybe one day, you know, you'll be able to cure people with your microbiome. In fact, there's an organization called humanmicrobes.org. You can go to their website. They're offering $180,000 a year for stool donors that have adequate uh, microbiomes for their purpose. And so they're, they're studying uh, human microbes uh, to see which ones are available to help cure and treat people. So this is a very exciting space. It's, a, it's really the Wild West. Um, I, I throw in a note of caution because in these FMTs, uh, people are doing these now in their garages and their bathrooms with other people. You, um, I really would recommend that you not do that because you want to get the healthiest people. And who the healthiest people are is in most cases elusive. I, I would take an FMT from Max, just looking at Max. <laughs> I'm going to start selling my poop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but the average person. If I ever person, need the money, it's good to know that I can. Uh, yeah, know. man. It's, I think it's going to be always be really, able to pay my rent. Yeah, really good money. And that's a five minute job for $180,000 a year if you could get picked up for it. But uh, you really should be thinking about living your life, in my opinion to try to have the health, healthiest microbiome. And there are a lot of services out there. Um, I don't have any financial affiliation with one called Tend Health, T-E-N-D space health, um, dot com. But they, they do, in my opinion, a very good job with their microbiome sequencing. Uh, they, uh, they, they provide that as service. And unlike most people, uh, they do it for money. They're not selling supplements. Hmm. So very often the case when people are doing microbiome sequencing, they say, buy this supplement for us to help you improve it. So it tends to almost come off as more of a marketing 
uh, venture than it is a, as a biological optimizing service. But Ten Health does true microbiome sequencing for hospitals and for physicians. Um, I don't think as an individual you can order uh, from them, but you can work with your <clears throat> primary physician uh, just like you could for an MRI, get your physician to order that for you and have an idea of where you are in your, in your microbiome sequencing. Hmm. Most people, though, that advocate for a microbiome-centered approach to health, though, often will espouse the benefits of consuming lots of dietary fiber, fruits, vegetables, and things like that. But you take a, a more carnivore style I do. approach. I do. So I do not eat much volume in terms of fruits and vegetables. Um, I, eat, I think um, I like to uh, instruct and, and guide my clients to eat fermented foods as, as a garnish. So you kind of think of like a hamburger with a little bit of mustard on it. You have a hamburger with a little kimchi, hamburger with a little kvass, uh, a little fermented sauerkraut, uh, even blue cheese. And so it's, it's a garnish, it's not a side dish, it's not large volume. And the microbial contribution has far more benefit than the fibrous competition, uh, contribution of uh, fibrous food. So mm. in many cases where there are studies out there that show that fiber is inflammatory and leads to constipation, and it's not always uh, the case that it's effective. So <clears throat> what's mediating this, in my opinion, why we get mixed results in studies, is the dynamic nature of the microbiome. And so what is really predicated uh, in terms of the outcome is your level of microbiome. And this is why uh, people that uh, are able to consume fruit and honey and some carbohydrates not put on weight is because their microbiome permits them to do so. But I would submit if you're somebody who's doing that, and, and Dr. Paul Saladino um, is very, very smart. He's dude smarter than I am. Uh, he's also healthier than me, but he's also 15 years younger. He's very dogmatic, though. He, yeah, he um, is. Yeah, I r respect respect to you know to him and what he does in his work, but not my cup of tea. Yeah, so he he is. I think that's fair to say that he is dogmatic. Um, and my concern about what he's saying is that I think what he's espousing. Uh, may work for a, a small population, a number of people. But here's what I think we'll find is over a period of time um, that, that people are going to change their microbiome to more carbohydrate dependent, particularly uh, the sugary types, sweet types, honey uh, and fruit will be replaced with other things and it will lead to cravings. I know in my, my older population, more diseased population, some people tried to add in honey and fruit and ended up having very bad results. It, ve it very quickly led to visceral fat uh, accumulation, weight gain, and uh, and so it changes your microbiome. So um, I think the microbiome is the black box that is in many people that it really defines uh, their metabolism, their level of health, and their capacity for eating diet. And what I like to encourage people to to eat more towards uh, a microbiome enhancing diet. So eating uh, first, not drinking water that has chlorine and not consuming processed foods that have food preservatives and they're disruptive to your microbes that reside in your gut. And then being very, very, very judicious about the use of antibiotics. Hmm. In many cases, um, you know, emergency medicine, uh, I felt it was necessary to start people on antibiotics because they were so unhealthy we had to help help them quickly. But um, for the most part, if people are healthy, um, the first course of action may not be starting antibiotics. It simply might be, I want to see you again in, tomorrow. Or maybe I want to see you again uh, through the internet in six hours or two hours. Let's see how you're doing and track an infection that way instead of starting antibiotics. So I think uh, the default presumption that everybody needs to have antibiotics needs to be questioned by the reality that these antibiotics are disrupting our beautiful microbiomes. And so um, that, that's They're definitely overprescribed. I mean, there are certainly life-saving use cases for them, but uh, they, I feel like today, our prescriptions are written for them willy-nilly. Yes. Which is a big problem. So they, you know, they, along with chlorine and food preservatives, are, are disrupting a microbiome, but... Uh, 
you know, eating a, uh, a diet of good, healthy meat. And in the past, we, we would go out and we're the only species of animals, Max, that hunt uh, to hunt the, the best animal, the best in a tribe. You know, uh, Native Americans would hunt the very healthiest appearing bison uh, to get its uh, better, highest, more nutritional meat. And also the coat, the skin on that animal had secret powers that the Native Americans referred to. But in reality, is it was their microbes. Mm. So that healthiest animal lived a healthier life, and it conferred those microbes onto the human that actually got that skin to wear or used it as, as a rug. And so this, it's interesting to me, my explanation to why we have this legacy of attachment to clothing is nothing more than a vestige of when you wore uh, animal skins in the past, we would look, we could tell how awesome you were as a hunter <laughs> based on how healthy that skin was of that animal that, you, that was adorning your body. And so it literally said, you know, I am a badass hunter. Because look at the animal skin that I have on it. So today, the, that form has been replaced by jazzy clothes and stuff, but it has nothing to do with how good you hunt. You know, it, it's more about whether you bought fancy clothes. But in the past, in a species, it became important because there's a reflection of how well we were living our lives and how good we could hunt. Wow. So humans, I, I'd like to advocate my clients, bring that level of discernment with you when it comes to buying food. You, you need to look at, at meat, and, and, and this we should return back to that photograph that you, you, you correctly alluded to. The uh, steak? Kept, yeah, coming up on the steak. So when you go to a grocery store, you want to be buying uh, not an animal with a lot of that, hu- that marbling in the steak. Hmm. This is an animal that's fed a lot of grain, soy, corn, carbohydrates, molasses. And most recently, when I was on Drew uh, Pruitt show, he, he informed me that there was a news story that a cattle feed truck, Drew found it, pulled it up, had tipped over on the highway and mixed into the cattle feed with Skittles. Skittles. Going to cows so that it could get purposely this myosteatosis, they weigh more. And so what do humans eat? You know, processed carbohydrates, and we get the same marbling. So what you want to eat is a species-specific diet. A a cow should be eating grass. And when I showed this image to one of my clients that had come to me, he was a veterinarian. He shared with me, Sean, I never, he was a farm veterinarian, by the way. He wasn't taking care of goldfish and parakeets and cats (laughs) and dogs. He took care of farm animals. He said, I never got called on a grass-fed cow. Wow. He said, I made all my money on the grain-fed cows because hmm. they're the ones that get sick. Now, isn't that reminiscent of the problem we have with humans? Absolutely. Yeah. So you're advocating more for lean, at least as far as this, this picture goes, this illustration yeah. goes, lean red meat, which is, I guess, a, a difference of opinion when looking at the low-carb community as it has sort of fomented over the past few years as a result of, I think, the demonization of fat that occurred in the 70s and 80s, there has been this big dogmatic push to welcome fat back to the... T- well, the, I think, I think yeah. welcoming fat back to the table has been an overall positive thing. But the pendulum, you know, as a society, I feel like we always overcorrect. Yeah. And so you have a lot of people in the low-carb keto uh, communities online advocating for the consumption, the frequent consumption of of what appears to be excessively fatty meat, meat yeah. like you know this this more diseased um, form that you're showing over there. And I've you know for a long time advocated for the consumption of lean meat, which lean, if you look again in certain pockets on the internet into these various diet tribes, it's almost like a four letter word. But in actuality, I think there is absolutely an argument to be made. Um, whereby lean meat is better for you than fatty meat. Yeah, no, I think you're you're spot on. So I I will add some fidelity to the noise that's out there. So um, this fat on the outside of that animal, I would eat it, but this fat on this uh, outside of that animal, I would not, because this animal is going to be more inflammatory. So fat is not all the same. 
fat from a healthy animal is going to be good, but if it's it cannot be healthy if it has this myosteatosis. So um, I do not have a veterinarian degree. Um, all of this insight I've taken simply from humans. When I see this in a human being on, uh, on an MRI, myosteatosis, fatty infiltrates in those legs that I showed before, horrific. They are just, are just filled with disease mm. and it's circling the drain. And I can't imagine that it's not uh, a reasonable analogy that you don't want that in a cow either. I mean, these this this fat and and that was the case with the veterinarian. Um, they get called for these these diseased animals and not ones that look like this. So you actually believe that the chemical composition of the fat in the leaner cut I, is different. I do fundamentally than I the do. fat. I do. I think this is going cut. to have a lot more inflammatory. If you looked at it from a t- nutritional standpoint, my guess is. Um, the composition of that fat will be more inflammatory. And in, uh, metabolically, if it's consumed within our bodies, it's, it's going to have a more of an inflammatory effect. Mm. So, yeah, we were meant to eat more healthier meat. We, our species hunted better. Lions and tigers, uh, other predators, they eat whatever's easy. You know, they eat the older animal, the, the one that was young, the cat, the one dragging its legs. But we have brains, Max. So our cerebral cortex allows us to think and discern which what is the healthiest animal. So if you're listening today, please, 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 you know, hunt and be discerning about the type of foods you're going to put in your mouth. I think Max is correct that you want to be eating more lean meat, particularly when lean means less fatty infiltrates within the muscle tissue, but it doesn't mean you want to cut that trim off. Um, that's going to be rich in omega-3s and conjugated linoleic acid. I do not have any financial interest in certified Piedmontese, but they, they are um, they're a breed of cattle that has very low fatty infiltrates. They sell 100% grass-fed, mm. grass-finished beef. Um, I got a, a, a discount code. I can't, I don't think I can share it on the the, the thing though is just from my clients I think and boy did they give me <laughs> they gave me a great code for my clients but it's because I don't get any money off of it but I'm afraid that they're it's too generous and they're going to be overwhelmed and then my clients won't be able to get the great oh, code no. but certified Pimani's um, I've heard about is, them actually great through my homies at uh Mark Bell's podcast. Oh yeah, where, yeah. Oh, does he? They, they they do ads for them or something. Oh, so I've heard I've okay. heard about. I've never tried. This meat, but apparently it's very lean and yeah. extraordinarily tender. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's really good stuff. There was a the hard to kill summit that Doctor Fit and Fabulous put on. Uh, Doctor Jamie Seaman, she um, she arranged for us to go out there and have that meat. And I honestly didn't go, Max. You know, you go to these conferences and you're talking, you're kind of tired, and they're arranging for this dinner. And it was one hour, and we had to drive an hour to this place to go eat in this restaurant. I was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to stay in the hotel. <laughs> but I, I went, and I had the single best carnivore meal I've ever had in my lifetime. And I, I think it really was absolutely delicious. I ate about six pounds of meat. I ate four during that minute. I ate two tomahawks and then more end pieces that came out. Then they gave us a doggy bag of another two, two and a half pounds of meat. And in the car ride home, I finished that off. <laughs> and uh, um, and then it was uh, Dave Feldman was in the front seat, and he was talking about cholesterol and, and you know the cool stuff he's mm-hmm. doing. And all I was thinking about was like, could I get to Dave's bag and eat that meat? That's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. I eat very similar to you. I eat a ton of meat, and uh, and I love it, and I feel great. But I also eat lots of fruits and vegetables. So you should try, definitely try at least adding in fermented fruits and vegetables. Not maybe necessarily, I'm not advocating that you have to abandon all your fresh fruits and vegetables, but see what happens, Max, when you start adding them in. You get the same nutritional benefit, Yeah, you just minus the toxins, and you get the also the microbial benefit. So what are some of your favorite in. fermented foods? Yeah, so my favorite are kimchi, uh, fermented sauerkraut, fermented pickles, fermented k- curtido, What's curtido? Uh, curtido is kind of like a fermented sauerkraut with a uh, more fermented spice into it. So there'll be more jalapenos and maybe ghost pepper. So you can think of it as like um, kind of a, a more spicy Mexican form of Yum. sauerkraut. Yeah, this stuff is awesome. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy how much it complements the, 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 the meat-based dinner that I'm eating. And here's the interesting thing, more for your money. I notice when I go to those 
uh, Brazilian tourist Korea places, the guys and, and women who walk around, they got the chunks of meat on the skewers and they slice mm. your meat off. That I literally doubled the amount of meat I can consume when I consume it with ferments. So it optimizes your microbiome. So I went from two pounds to four pound consumption when I get to those places. Mm. And you know, they're probably one of the few restaurants that you can bring your own food into, they're not gonna have a problem because that means you're not gonna be eating as much. But when they figure out, now dang, I just said it on social <laughs> media. Once they figure out that people showing up with ferments are, <laughs> are gonna cut into their profits, they're gonna be banning the little ferment. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, run with it while you can if you're a follower of Max. I gotta give a shout out to um, H&H in Los Angeles. How long are you in town for? Um, I'm here till tomorrow. So. Well, but you're in and out. You're you're in LA. Yeah, I feel I'll like, come back again. Often. So there's yeah. a place called H and H Brazilian okay. Steakhouse. Oh, in Los Angeles. There's one in downtown LA, and there's okay. one underneath the Beverly Center, which is like a big mall in LA. And uh, it's some of the best. It's the best Brazilian churrascaria, churrasco yeah. I've I've ever had, and all the meat is grass fed. Oh, yeah. I don't think that they've changed it, but Dang. when I when I first started going, and I believe this is still the case, I have no reason to believe otherwise. All grass fed, all the produce is organic. Wow, yeah, it's incredible. I think I'm going there tonight. You should. Yeah, man. Yeah, H and H. Big I'll shout check out. It out. No affiliation. Okay, <laughs> but I go with my brothers all the time, and we go with big appetites. And the beef rib that they have there, oh my god. Yeah, so good. Yeah, well, I'll look uh, look forward to going to that because it is a problem for my clients when they travel looking for sources of grass-fed beef. And I think as we, uh, as inflows in the space, do a better job with promoting uh, not just getting healthy, but truly trying to optimize your health and the benefits that befall those that are fortunate to understand really optimizing their health, then I think we're going to see extension of our influence going into like restaurants and food providers and supplement companies, I think we're going to have this this compounding benefit influence within the space. So uh, I'm excited to see where this goes. I think we're in our infancy. Thank God for social media. Thank God for you and for people that have podcasts that promote this kind of content that really can help people um, not only just eliminate disease, but start improving their lives. And then hopefully, if you're listening, share this podcast with other people. Share, you know, Max, and tell them about uh, the awesome things that are that, that that are available to them when they listen. Because this content is not through social media; it's not being shared through conventional health space. And people need to know um, that there is another existence out there other than just falling apart, accumulating more disease and uh, getting more and more prescription drugs. You can actually improve. Exactly, copy the link to this podcast or if you're watching it on YouTube, copy the URL, text it to your friends and loved ones. I mean, this is such important information. I couldn't agree more. Could you talk, could you talk about the relationship between stress and visceral fat? Because I know that there's a big connection there. Huge, yeah. So um, a really powerful example of this came from, come, comes from a follower uh, who shared this um, really interesting story with me. So he was, he was in the film industry and uh, he 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 did editing work. So um, your 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 kind of your background. So he he here he is in his photograph. And during this week, he looks horrible because he's had uh, two heart attacks, full cardiac arrest. This guy got Whoa. CPR twice in one week. I mean, what a story! So that's a bad week. He does not look good. And then, what would you imagine is the time period from his face here to this face here? What do you think? How long of a time period is it from from I don't know. I mean, he's, he looks he a couple months, years. So it's actually three months, and he significantly improved his face that much. And the only thing he really did was he quit his job that caused so much stress. Mm. And he went from doing film editing, where he was constantly under pressure, uh, to doing this, where he worked outdoors, and he did leather work. Wow. And now this guy um, is an awesome guy, such a nice guy from uh, uh, England. Tom does leather work for the film industry. So now he does periodic clothing. He creates the jackets and the and the, the bags and all sorts of stuff that they need for movies, only he loves it. And so you can see the tremendous change in his face. So to get back to your answer, um, stress is besides processed foods, processed carbohydrates, what you eat is a big contributor of visceral fat. And we would see 
uh, persistent visceral fat. So I could take somebody, get them to clean up their diet, get them to do correct form of exercise, which really didn't get into too much, but my the best form of exercise actually to get rid of visceral fat is sprinting. So I can get them sprinting and eating healthy foods, but if they have stress, then they have this persistent visceral fat in there. And it's, it, and it's sort of like uh, somebody that might do exercise, but they keep eating processed carbohydrates. They still have all this visceral fat inside of them. The, the notion to really improve your health, Max, is, is doing what you're doing. You live an optimally healthy life. Every choice that you are consciously aware of, you, you make a choice to, to, for your health. You're not going to consciously hurt your health. You're way ahead of everybody else. Other people will be making choices mostly out of ignorance. They just don't know. But visceral fat accumulates because of stress. And this, I think, is a, a large area of exposure because a lot of people um, pr- put up with, with stress in their lives uh, unwittingly. They're not aware that it has this really, really harmful effect inside of them. So we would see in people, they're doing everything well, but they, they're stressed out. They have a huge amount of visceral fat. So uh, what this means is I have learned as a health and performance optimizing physician that, that the biggest area of stress that seems to be coming in on people is how they're hunting. They, they hunt poorly, and meaning they, they hate their jobs. Mm. They're, they're, they got all this stress in their jobs. And so now I advocate get out of a job that you hate, do something you love so you can reduce that visceral fat. So um, next week, I have the honor to be able to go and speak to Texas A&M, to a couple student groups down there. And I've been invited to talk about health optimization, how what you should do in your, your as an 18-year-old to 21-year-old, what, what you should be aware of to optimize your health for the rest of your life. But I feel compelled, even though I'm just a physician in this particular space, to talk about wealth optimization that you got to learn how to hunt and make money because, you know, let's face it, if you didn't make a living out of this, Max, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, doing the, all these awesome things, and you wouldn't look so good because you'd be stressed out because you're, you're stressed out because you can't bring home the bacon. You're not yeah. bringing home that meat when you yeah. go out and hunt. Exactly. And so my talk is going to be on health and wealth optimization for a lifetime, arriving at retirement debt and disease free. And so – it's good to make money. You got to make a living, but you want to do that in a way that doesn't cost stress. And so, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully, I'll be, able, I'll be able to reach these young people at Texas A&M. Yeah, right. what a cool talk! You'll have to send me a link if it ever makes it online. But what what is the mechanism by which stre- I know that there's a cortisol connection? Yeah. Our visceral our visceral adipocytes seem to be uh, exquisitely sensitive to exactly. to cortisol, which is uh, it's the waking hormone, but it's also the stress hormone. Yes. Yeah, so cortisol's production causes visceral adiposity, so to accumulate, and also makes it refractory. So even uh, even if you are are, are absent uh, eating sufficient calories, your ability to fight and burn off that fat through lipolysis is impaired in the presence of cortisol literally inhibits the burning of fat called lipolysis. So it's really a very, very harmful uh, molecule to have long-term. It's awesome for short-term. We're meant to have stress like we're in a battle, you know, for a fight. Uh, we're, we're hunting. Uh, cortisol plays a role. But today, we, through our vocations or jobs, we have chronic uh, cortisol levels that, that far exceed our species capacity for maintaining and benefiting from that cortisol for a short period of time. And so that added adiposity, uh, the accumulation of visceral fat causing all the inflammation ends up causing this harm. So instead of being this beneficial molecule uh, that is intended to be short term, it's this harmful molecule that hangs around and contributes uh, contributes to disease. So I get my clients to abate stress, one, uh, getting rid of the lions and tigers. So kill them. If you can't solve those problems, uh, I mean, if you can solve the problems, you kill them. Uh, but if you can't, um, then you got to migrate away from them. If you, if you can't kill those lions and tigers in your life, so go get another job. But sometimes you can't migrate from these problems, and you know that. I mean, you can't change a job, or 
um, maybe it, it's a child that is got a, a fatal illness and you cannot, you, you don't have a choice in that. So what do you do in that particular situation? Well, antelopes that can't get away from lions and tigers, um, they're stressed out, they're milling around, are actually benefited when that lion and tiger attacks and they sprint like Hades to get away, it reduces their cortisol level. Hmm. So what you should do if you're listening today and you've got a persistent lion in your life and you cannot get rid of it, you cannot kill it, then you sprint. Whoa. Every time you have a stressful encounter, an email, a phone call from that lion or whatever is causing stress in your life or you see it and it's a problem, you drop and do 50 push-ups. You do 20 pull-ups. You go out and do you know two to three, four, six sprints. And you answer that uh, stressful cortisol level with some maximum intensity exercise for a short, brief period of time. And then that abates the cortisol and the visceral fat will go away. But there's always a biological response to any kind of a scenario. And so maximum intensity exercise works far better than going to the gym for an hour and a half or going out and jogging or doing a marathon for three hours. You want to do maximum intensity exercise to abate that stress. Damn, super interesting. Mm -hmm. And makes perfect sense, at least through the lens of evolution. Yeah, and it works so good anecdotally with my clients who are stressed out. That's how they finally move ahead and start eliminating uh, their visceral fat. It's just, uh, uh, it's really key imperative. And it's a bigger problem, Max, than I think most people are aware of, this accumulation of stress in their lives. And uh, I think we need to do a, a better job, uh, certainly within healthcare and in the space, health, health space and uh, social media, uh, bringing people uh, to, to be aware of, of uh, to start questioning the, the presence and the contribution, negative contribution that stress is having unrecognized in their lives and how to get rid of it. Hmm. Isn't there a stressed out phenotype of like the apple shaped body, but super skinny legs, super skinny arms? Yeah, long term. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is that cortisol, um, and we see that it gives you, we call it a medical school, school a, co- a cushionoid type of look. Cushionoid. So cushionoid. Yeah. They get, they get uh, moon faces, which is that big inflamed face from the presence of cortisol and visceral fat deposition. So you get central adiposity with the, the abdomen and then skinny legs. And so very often we see in, in people when, when we scan them, a good example is um, this image uh, right here uh, that, uh, that I, I grabbed with three sets of MRIs from uh, different people. Um, a 40-year-old, a 74-year-old, and another 74-year-old. Here we see the muscle mass declining this person that would, we don't have the benefit of an abdominal uh, MRI scan, but uh, I can tell with uh, that fragmenting and atrophying of the muscle, the lost sarcopenia there, that they have elevated visceral fat. Hmm. And so they'll end up with skinny, tiny, scrawny legs. They're 74 here, but by the time they're, if they live long enough, um, by the time they're 90, um, they will have very little skinny legs. And uh, the other interesting thing is you should be aware of is the bone is black on an MRI scan. So you have these nice thick bones in the 74-year-old here with no fatty infiltrates in those muscles. See how lean they are? So they will have no visceral fat. This person will have a lot of visceral fat. Wow. But check out their bones, Max. Look how thin they are. Yeah. And so they have loss of muscle and they have loss of bone. And they will have been sedentary and a lot of visceral fat. And they probably had CTs and MRIs. And if you're listening, these are not red. Nobody warns you your muscles are falling apart. Nobody warns you you get, you get marbling in your muscles. And nobody's warning you that your bones are thinning there. And so when you're 85 years of age and you fracture that bone because it's so thin, it just breaks, your mortality is 95% certain. And one year, you're dead from that particular event. Whoa. And it's not, if you're listening, it's not from that broken bone. Because I can take this guy who's 74 and let's say he's 85, break that leg, he or she won't die. Because look at those beautiful muscles, mm. no visceral fat, 
they're going to be fine for the next year. But this person, by the time they've thinned those bones that much and reduced their muscle mass, they've so destroyed their metabolism and their overall physiological health that they're not going to be able to make it. And so this is the interesting thing. You mentioned I'm a lawyer. I found this fascinating. When it comes to treatment of this person when they're 85, the doctors can look at that person and say, we're not going to treat you. We're calling hospice. You get no treatment. Wow. And the reason is they can point to science and says, if you needed help getting up out of a chair, then we call hospice. But if you could get up out of a chair on your own, then we'll fix it. And the difference is uh, when they fix somebody to get up out of the chair on their own, they get better. But if you take somebody who needed help to get up out of the chair and you fix it, it doesn't matter. They're still going to die. And so literally your fate is sealed because you've arrived at the age of 85 and you can't simply get up out of a chair like that. Mm. You can't lift yourself up. And so you've lost your muscle mass and the ability to live a normal life and it's been sinisterly, secretly taken from you through that accumulation of visceral fat and that nobody's warning you about. But all over every encounter is your cholesterol. Yeah. How's that working out for you? You're 85 and you got great cholesterol, but you can't get up and out of a chair. Mm. So that's why I think it's really important. I'm so glad that you had me on your show to talk about these biomarkers. Oh, this is life-changing information. Yeah, I it really, it is. And the thing about cholesterol is that it's become, it's not just a biomarker. It's a biomarker that's become heavily politicized, commercialized. And that's why I think the hyper-focus on it is... It's, I mean, it's, it's certainly myopic, yeah. but I also think it's misguided. And that's yeah. not to say that it's not important, but to hyper-focus on it in lieu of all of these other um, characteristics that you've so eloquently shared with me today and my audience um, is a big missed stake. So. Yeah, the cholesterol, the uh, a criticism I have as a researcher of it as a metric is when you look at targets of what you should be following to actually optimize health and improve people. The two metrics that you can attach to kind of see how relevant or valuable targets are, are called signal and noise. So signal is what really truly matters. So for instance, if you're trying to understand a conversation uh, between two spies in a movie theater, you can listen directly on that conversation. The noise is what's called distraction, and it really doesn't matter. And so if you pay attention to what the scenes are going on in the movie, that's noise. And so the noise also distracts you from the signal. Mm. So cholesterol is just very dirty, and it's filled with a lot of noise. And that's why ultimately you see people with the lowest cholesterol have the, the uh, highest mortality when it comes to an MI, myocardial infarction and people with the, the highest cholesterol have lower levels of mortality, and people that have their first heart attack have normal levels. I mean, it's just all over the picture. There's just too much confounding. It's distracting. But true signal is much more apparent in visceral fat, and yet it's not promoted because it simply works too good I, they, it's kept from medical schools. It's literally not part of the, the curriculum in medical schools or mm. nursing schools or PA schools because it has the potential, in my opinion, it's kept because it would so grave, greatly improve the level of health of people that it was destroyed the largest part of our economy in the United States is healthcare, 90% of which is simply treating chronic disease that comes from visceral fat. And so uh, you're, you're talking about huge sums of money. It's more important than the internet, oil, or energy is healthcare. It literally is that important. And if you look at the problem with chronic disease, how much money we're throwing at it, it is humanity's biggest problem. Yeah. Because nothing costs us more money. Nothing do we waste more money on. Nothing destroys productivity of humans more than chronic disease. Nothing impairs the quality of lives of humans more than the accumulation of chronic disease. And nothing, Max, kills more people than chronic disease. 
and nobody's talking about it. Nobody wants you to talk about it. Nobody wants you aware about it. But it's that big of a problem. And the solution simply is getting rid of your visceral fat has the largest impact on eliminating chronic disease. That's what we saw in those 6,000 people. Not a single form of chronic disease in 6,000 people uh, didn't get better or go completely away when visceral fat was removed. Nothing to do with cholesterol. It's visceral fat. And also, I mean, I think this is something that gets lost in the in the warring factions that are the diet tribes online, that the top killers of vegans are still cancer and heart disease. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Like vegans yeah. who are out there adhering to these crazy fringe diets, right? Avoiding for dear life, some of the most delicious and nutrient dense foods available to us as humans, right? Yeah. Striving to get their, their ApoB levels to newborn levels, <laughs> which is completely yeah. not yeah. physiologic yeah, for an adult, crazy. right? But that's what they're striving for. Yeah. That's what they're striving for. They're chasing numbers. They're still lifestyle. getting killed primarily yeah. by cancer and heart disease. Yeah. Now I will say, you know, interestingly, I've had a few vegans approach me you know, even though I'm a carnivore physician and they work with me, they won't eat me. But what they found out is I'm right about visceral fat. And so they're tracking their visceral fat. And I will tell you, Max, I'm pretty excited. They are eliminating visceral fat, but they're doing so because they're getting rid of processed foods. They're eating foods more in, in, in uh, fermented. They're eating fermented foods and they're eating more complex carbohydrates. So they're eliminating the simple sugars and, uh, and, and the, the, the higher numbers of carbohydrates that they, they used to formerly eat. So this tool and ability to track visceral fat is improving those vegans. Yeah. Now, I will say not as fast as, as I do see in people that uh, switch to a carnivore diet and eating fermented foods, but um, it is exciting to see that vegans are becoming aware, at least in small numbers, yeah. of something <clears throat> other than just tracking cholesterol, yeah. ApoP, which I think is insane <laughs> that the people are just tracking numbers. Meanwhile, they're weaker, their bodies are falling apart, uh, their immunity is being decre decreased, they don't have as much energy. Uh, you know, if you look at long-term uh, vegans, they're atrophying because you know, their muscles, I call them ants. It's very sad that their heads stay the same size and their bodies are shrinking. And no one seems to be picking up on the, the accelerated sarcopenia that happens over decades. And we're not talking, and then I get old when I say this, well, look at this bodybuilder. Yeah, it's not five years, it's 10 years, it's 30 years. <laughs> but they have this accelerated sarcopenia and then they can't get it back. So track, you know, by MRI, see what's going on with your muscle. If you are you know, electing to eat vegan or you are vegan, look at your muscle to fat ratios, in particular visceral fat, deep subcutaneous fat, and superficial subcutaneous fat. And uh, people, you know, unfortunately in the vegan space are tracking numbers instead of the really healthy tissue uh, and disease tissue that they should be paying attention to. Absolutely. But they got that newborn ApoB. Yeah. So all is good, oh, right? Gosh. Bones are falling apart, depressed. <laughs> Low sperm quality. Shrinking bodies, yeah. no energy. Okay. Yeah. No shade. No shade. Um to the to the vegans out there. Uh well, Dr. O'Mara, this was an amazing masterclass. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah. This was so fun. Yeah. Well, I again I appreciate so much, Max, your invitation to come and be a part of your audience. And you know, kudos to you. You're doing a great job. Uh, looking good. You're you're standing up, being a great influencer in this space. And uh, so I wish you all the best with your program. And uh, yeah, I look forward to coming and talking. Do, do any collaborations anytime again. I had a great time. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.